I was first trained and certified as a mediator in 1997 and then in around 2006 I started to train other people to become mediators and I sometimes struggled to help my students learn how to mediate and part of the training involved me demonstrating different parts of the process. We were teaching a very standardised 12-step facilitative model. So I would demonstrate some part of the process and then I'd watch the students who would role play mediations and give them feedback. And one of the things that I noticed when I was doing this was that students often just copied things that they'd seen me do, but they didn't seem to understand why they were doing these things. And they also frequently became stuck and asked me for advice about what they should do when something unexpected happened. And there was never a completely foolproof answer to those kinds of questions, because in most situations, there were multiple possibilities for what they could do. And I didn't want to narrow their thinking by suggesting just one. Around this time, I came across Michael Lang and Alison Taylor's book, The Making of a Mediator. And it's honestly not an overstatement to say that it changed my life. The book introduced the concept of becoming a reflective practitioner to develop artistry in one's mediation practice. And as a direct result of reading this book, a number of fundamental things changed for me. Firstly, I spent a lot more time engaging in conscious reflection on my practice, both as a mediator and a mediation trainer. And I changed the way that I taught mediation. I included reflective activities for students throughout the mediation training program. When I demonstrated mediation skills, I also spent time speaking out loud what I was thinking as I was deciding what to do next. So I demonstrated mediation, but I also demonstrated how to engage in reflection in action during the mediation role play. I developed a set of reflective questions to ask the students during role plays when they sought direction. I wrote an article about it um, called Teaching Mediation as Reflective Practice that was published in the US Negotiation Journal. Later on, when I developed the Masters in Conflict Management and Resolution at James Cook University, I ensured that one of the foundation subjects that students had to do before they trained as a mediator or facilitator in negotiation, they had to do the subject ethics and reflective practice, because for me, those two things are inherently connected. So students had to develop knowledge and skills in reflective practice before they went on to the practice based subjects like mediation and conflict coaching. And finally, and something that I know Michael and I are going to talk about today, uh, I developed the real conflict management coaching system that is based on supporting people to reflect on their experiences of conflict for the purpose of developing their competence and confidence to manage it better themselves in the future. It's to enable people to manage conflict, but hopefully aspire to artistry in their own personal interactions in conflict situations, not just as practitioners. So for me, reflection is, is something that everyday people can do with a bit of support um, to, to develop artistry in their day-to-day -day life. So since then, Michael has published a second book, The Guide to Reflective Practice in Conflict Resolution, which I know many of you have read and which has had a significant impact on developing everybody's artistry as conflict resolution practitioners. And so today I'm delighted and honoured to have the opportunity to speak with Michael Lang virtually in person um, and to have a conversation about reflective practice and to share Michael's wisdom with you. So thank you, Michael. I know that probably seems a little bit over the top, but it's absolutely true. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. And I know that a lot of my students have had similar experiences. I've had people say to me, oh, I've just read Michael Lang's new book. Oh, my goodness. It's changed the way that I, it, way I think about my practice, that I develop in my practice. You're continuing to have a really significant impact on people. And I really hope as an as Personally, I really hope that your impact can, continues to grow widely because we have a lot of mediation and coaching practitioners out there. I don't think we have a critical mass of practitioners who are reflective practitioners. And for me, that's a real shame and maybe go some way to explaining why mediation is sort of, you know, not as big a deal as it could be, not, not contributing as much to people's management of conflict as, as people who are kind of true believers, I suppose, think it should be. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I, I think <clears throat> many things. Um, <laughs> but yes, I think that what has happened, and, and I can speak more particularly, of course, about what's happening in the United States, 
although I have friends and colleagues, you know, in other places. Um, and that is that mediation has become um, an instrument for achieving a result. It isn't uh, viewed um, in a significant way anymore as a process by which people engage with one another to figure out what, if anything, they want to do about the dispute between themselves. Mm. Instead, it is a forced march between sitting down at the table and walking out of the room with an agreement. And I'll give you one example that I was stunned when I moved to Florida and decided, uh, when I moved to Florida in the early 2000s, I was um, busy teaching and I wasn't thinking about trying to develop a practice because it was, it's a lot of work. And I, I didn't have the sort of connections that one would need in order to build a practice. But a few years later, I said, I don't know, I'm, I really feel the need to get back into active practice. And um, then I began to learn about the way in which mediation was conducted. Now, let me just start say, this is generally true for, for all civil mediation as well as family, but I'll speak specifically about family. Mm -hmm. Parties come in with an attorney, each with a counsel. There is a, an initial conversation um, in which the mediator does her or his thing of explaining what mediation is about. It's, you know, the sort of, sort of standard introduction. And then the parties go to separate rooms and they stay in separate rooms mm -hmm. as long as it takes to complete the mediation. Hmm. They, they don't stop until there's either an agreement or a decision that there won't be an agreement. So those mediations can last six, eight hours, sometimes longer, but longer is a, is a rarity. And part of the reason it's a rarity is because there's so much pressure to achieve a settlement mm -hmm. on the part of the mediator and counsel. The parties have no interaction with one another. Their messages are communicated through the mediator in the same way that they're in, in non-mediation situations, the lawyers would be communicating for the parties back and forth with one another. And, and as a result, there is no real process. There's only an outcome that's mm -hmm. considered. And I think that it has, um, it has also taken mediators away from the notion that they are actually engaging in a facilitative process and instead they're looking at it solely in a in a functionary utilitarian way mm. let's get the deal done mm. so there's no you know the, why would they reflect on their experience the only thing that matters is my settlement rate mm. even within that very narrow sort of vision of what mediation's purpose is, there's, there still would be some room for reflection though, wouldn't there, on, on how effective they might be in, in persuading parties to settle and what sort of things might work and might not work and, you know, being a bit creative perhaps, even within that narrow constraint, there's still room for them to reflect and develop their practice within the, those narrow boundaries. You're absolutely right. Of course there is. It's that there's not the inclination to do it. That's all I'm speaking to, not, not the possibility. You know, I have, for the last four years, I have facilitated a monthly group uh, that's sponsored by the American Bar Association section on dispute resolution. And um, uh, we have, uh, these are all lawyer mediators. We have a couple of outliers. Uh, people whom I've invited, whom I know are really competent and interesting mediators who aren't members of the ABA, but since I, I hope they're not listening, the ABA is, but, um, you know, I, I get to make that choice and yeah. nobody cares because the meetings are successful. We have 12 to 15 people every month. It's a drop-in group. And we've talked about construction disputes. Um, uh, copyright 
and patent infringement, family, landlord tenant, community, uh, a whole range. And, and they are lawyers, uh, lawyer mediators who practice in a variety of ways. Some of them are, are focused on a more joint experience where the parties are in the room and they work in an organic and direct way to, to have a conversation and see where that leads. And others are, uh, are more um, solution focused and very directive. And we all participate together. So there's a perfect you know, example of, um, of exactly what you were just saying, Samantha, that of course it's possible. Mm, yeah. And I guess it's easy to get sort of defensive about what, what our beliefs are that, you know, getting an outcome is the priority, getting parties to communicate more effectively is the priority. And if that's the, the thing that you, you value the most and, and then someone else says, oh, you should think differently about that, perhaps you should try something different, a natural response is often for people to get defensive and defend their, their course of action, which is kind of the opposite of reflective practice, isn't it? Reflective practice is being open to looking at it differently and questioning yourself. And that's often an uncomfortable experience for people. It, you know, the unnatural inclination when someone invites us to think about something we value differently is to get defensive and become more entrenched. Yeah, and, and I found that the, <clears throat> my best way of approaching people who have some general resistance, they're not dismissive, <clears throat> they're just reluctant, they're not sure that there's any real benefit. Oh, this is a sort of a touchy feely thing where we all talk about our feelings. No. I said, this is pragmatic. It's, it's, there are direct, observable, experienced benefits. Mm -hmm. Your practice will be better. Mm -hmm. And you used um, an expression earlier, uh, two words, competence and confidence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both of which are improved. Yeah. Because if you feel more competent, then you, will, then you will be more competent and you will feel more confidence in your work. And that's how I have to approach people who are, are uh, naysayers, if you will, or at least skeptic, skeptics. I was, Allison and I were doing a presentation, this is long, long ago, uh, at, a, at a conference um, of an organization, the Academy of Family Mediators, uh, that's no longer exists. It's been subsumed into the Association for Conflict Resolution. And uh, so Allison and I knew all of the people in the room, you know, because we had been very actively involved in the organization for years. And one of the people um, spoke up and he said, you know, Michael, I don't have time for this reflective practice stuff. And I knew he was kind of a, not a very competent mediator, and I don't remember his name now, I'll use Bill. I said, Bill, you don't have time not to. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, a knee-jerk reaction on my part, which was, <laughs> I, I reflected on afterwards and said, that's probably not the best thing to have said. But it's but probably I, true. I was, I was frustrated with the, the closed-mindedness, mm. that's all. Mm. You know, people try it and they say it's not for them, okay. I read something recently that said that um, people who have imposter syndrome, who are kind of frequently nervous about their abilities in their particular field, are often very good at reflective practice, that it often motivates people to question themselves and to evaluate theory and to have ongoing professional development. Um, so perhaps the, the, oh, sorry, now my dog's here. Um, Perhaps the, the opposite of that is those people who are overconfident are often the ones that most need reflection. They're so overconfident, they don't see what they, that, that, where they could develop, where they could do things differently. I think that's, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge that I face are, are, is the skepticism that comes, not just because this is different. Uh, and you're right, there are, are any number of people for whom that's true. It is the people um, who say, you know, why do I need this? Mm. I mean, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, um, look at my settlement rate. 
Yeah. Why should I do anything differently if 98% of my cases settle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I get, if I'm so busy and I have such a roster of referrals, you know, I have plenty of work. I've done thousands and thousands of mediations. Why should I take the time to do this? And it's hard that people don't see there's potential to improve. You know, no matter how experienced you are, there's always room to improve and to learn and to grow. It's that, you know, the, the path to artistry doesn't ever end, does it? No. <laughs> there isn't no, a point I, where you say, I've made it. <laughs> no, and that's the point that Alison and I made in that book, which is that this is a journey. I mean, I, I, I know that's a real trite phrase. Yes. But it is that it's never ending. You, yeah. You'll never get to a place of perfection. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and it um, people's resistance to reflection. I mean, partly it's laziness. I don't have time, but it seems to be more, more sort of psychological. What do you think that it gets in the way of people thinking it's a good idea, at least to give it a try? I think it's two things. I do think time, people imagine how much time it's going to take. And of course, it does take time. Um, uh, but as I point out to people, I, you know, because I also, like you, have developed some instruments to help people reflect and, and people say, well, you know, how much time is this going to take? And I said, let me tell you a quick story. I developed those instruments based upon an experience I had when I was, uh, I, I attended a couple of years of training in family therapy to help me with my mediation work because I was fascinated by systems thinking. Mm -hmm. And before we were able to meet with, with uh, clients, um, we had to complete um, a card, answer a variety of questions, including what's your hypothesis? Mm -hmm. What's your intervention? What interventions are you likely to use in respect to that hypothesis? How will you know whether that's been successful? What will you do if it has not been? What's your alternative? Okay. And then we had to complete a similar uh, set of questions afterward. Mm -hmm. And as I described to the students, the first time I did, did those, it took me 30 to 45 minutes to answer those few questions. I said, by the time you know the, my training was up, I was able to do it in five to 10 minutes yeah. because the work had already been happening up here. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to stop and think first because I'd been thinking all along. Mm -hmm. I said the same thing will be true with these instruments or any matter of reflective practice. It's new to you. You're going to be awkward. You're, it's going to be confusing. It's going to be a little unsettling at first. So what? So yeah. just plan to take a little bit of time and what you'll find is after you have, have done that, you will become so much, you become acutely aware of what you need to be reflecting on, not just everything that has happened. Mm -hmm. You'll be focused, you'll be ex, you know, um, expedient, uh, efficient at doing it. Mm -hmm. It will just take you a few minutes and you'll go, oh my. And it's yeah. a skill like driving a car, isn't it? When you first do it, it takes a lot of time. It's a bit clunky. You're not quite sure where you're going or whether you're doing it right. And then before you know it, you're driving along, you drive between your home and your work and you don't even realise, you know, the intersections you've passed along the way. It just sort of happens without you having to pay attention to it. And it's the same thing, right. isn't it? Reflective practice is a skill that you develop and it, you know, it, there's a benefit in it becoming kind of internalised and part of your day-to-day um, thinking, but then you also have to go back and and make it make it strange again, so that you don't get in a pattern of reflecting the same way over and over again and missing an opportunity to to develop further. Right, and I one of the examples I use in support of that um, is an American basketball player. He's now retired, Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. who was considered uh, at the time uh, and probably still now if not the best, one of the two or three best basketball players ever. And I point to what he did after a game. 
he took time to think about the mistakes that he had made, why they happened, and what he could do differently. And then the next day, he went out on the court and he practiced mm -hmm. until he could become better and better and better. And it's the same thing. If people play golf, they go to the driving range. Why do they do that? They don't just go out and play a round of golf. They go to the putting green. People who play tennis, they have these machines, you know, spitting balls at them. Why? Yeah. Right? To learn how to improve the quality of their practice. So, so this is no different. I think you've hit on something, though, there that can also create a bit of resistance for people. This idea that reflection is about learning from your mistakes. For a lot of people, admitting that they've made mistakes or even acknowledging that they've made mistakes is something that's very hard for people to do. And so I wonder sometimes whether there's a way to motivate people to engage in it that doesn't necessarily refer to things that have gone wrong or having made mistakes. It's just questioning, could things have gone differently? I know that's a trite question as well, but looking at different possibilities, moments where you could have chosen a different intervention and what might have happened. Um, so could it have been... Um, I don't know, a missed opportunity to add value rather than a mistake. You know, yes, you still got a settlement, you've ticked that box, but were there opportunities to do more than that, that, that you haven't noticed because you've been so focused on that end goal? Yeah, you know, in, in, the, in the first book, The Making of the Mediator, Alison and I referred to those as critical moments. Yeah. <clears throat> critical because they were choice points mm -hmm. for a mediator. And um, I don't use that phrase anymore, <clears throat> pardon me, not because it doesn't have value. I, I was very proud of our collaboration and coming up with that. It is that in order to avoid the stigma that reflective practice is only about, um, about errors, I do two things. One, I refer to them as puzzling or surprising situations yes. because those aren't judgmental. Um, and secondly, I do an exercise um, often when I'm teaching, which is to ask people to describe a success story. Mm -hmm. But I don't mean success in terms of the outcome. I mean how they perceive themselves as being successful. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them how that occurred. Yes. What, what was going on? What were they aware of? What were they were thinking? And it's surprising how much then begins to um, unfold. Um, it's just like the, the, you know, the, the trite but proverbial and useful onion. You know, it's yeah. taking away layer by layer and seeing that they have a core set of beliefs and values that were guiding them the whole way yeah. and how they can make purposeful access to those so that they are always making choices and they know the reason because we are always making choices mm -hmm. and they know the reason why they're doing that yes yeah. and there's such a difference isn't there when you learn something by your own sort of self-reflection and your own experiences and drawing in other sources but there's a difference when it's coming from your own um, surprising or puzzling moment and then you've sort of done some research that might be of your own thoughts, of other people's feedback, of what the, the canon says, but it's such a different experience than someone just telling you, oh, that's what you should do. You know, that's the, that's the rule about what you do in that situation. It's such a different experience. And that's something I noticed a lot when I was teaching. People would come who were very experienced mediators who wanted to come and get a degree, get a, a postgraduate qualification in the field to help them stand out a little bit from all the other experienced mediators out there. And some of them were surprisingly uh, uncritical about some of the, the fundamental concepts. You know, they would say things like, I guarantee to my clients that this session's confidential. And I'd say, okay, so how do you guarantee that? How do you make sure that, that it's confidential, that they don't tell anyone else? Well, I tell them that it is. Okay, and can you think of a, an occasion or a situation where that might not be enough? And they're like, no, no. You know, that's, and it's, 
funny sometimes how surprisingly uncritical they can be. They hold on to what they've been told, but they never really understand the purpose behind it, the flexibility and the, you know, the possibilities behind it. They just hold on to what they've been told, repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And yes, it works to a point, but there are times when you're really going to get yourself unstuck without that deeper reflection. And, and that's where the distinction of reflective practice from other methods of helping us learn as a result of our experiences yeah. is that in the is that we want to be able to challenge people's assumptions challenge them to identify their own assumptions not because i have a different set of values that i want to impart mm -hmm. but because i want to know what what values or assumptions or beliefs they're using mm -hmm. in order to guide their decisions. Yes. And then if they understand the limitations of them, and that's why the question, can you imagine a situation in which telling people that this is confidential might not be sufficient, mm -hmm. invites them to think, not just about those situations, but to use those situations to question their own beliefs yes. about the value of their words as, um, as, the, um, as the true statement of what confidentiality is about. And having pronounced that, you all will be under, you will all understand, right? Yes. And Not yeah, a chance. Asking people to identify their assumptions also doesn't necessarily mean that their assumptions are flawed. And this is an experience I had when I was giving students feedback. Um, students would do something in a mediation role play and I'd think, oh, that was not what I was expecting them to do there. Or that's not what I would do in that situation. And I had seen other people say, oh no, you shouldn't do that. No, what you need to do in that situation is this. Once I'd read that, that your book with Alison and I'd come up with these reflective questions, I would, instead of doing that, I would say to them, when that happened, tell me what you were thinking. Like, what, what, what made you decide to do that? And sometimes when they explained it to me, I'd, like, I'd say, that's a great explanation. When I saw you do it, I didn't understand where that was coming from. It seemed weird to me. It seemed wrong from my point of view. But now you've explained your hypothesis, I suppose. You know that makes perfect sense how interesting right because that's part of the that's part of the value for example of talking about success mm -hmm. not just struggles i'm not i'm not going to use the word mistake because yes. <laughs> i don't want i don't want to anchor that in people's minds uh -huh. um having just said it it is it is that it's not that when you ask people to question their assumptions the underlying idea is for them to be aware of those assumptions, uh -huh. not that you want to challenge them, question them, or counter them. It's yeah. that if they are aware, um, you know, this is, this is the piece that, that I loved from Arjuris and Sean, mm -hmm. um, the difference between espoused belief mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, and espouse theory and theory in action. Yeah. What you say you believe, right? But what you do, what's much more important is what you're actually doing in the moment. And are you being consistent with your beliefs? If you are, there's a unity that exists between your thought and your action that will give your actions greater strength. You know, I describe it often that if you're not aware of those things it's like trying to juggle while standing on one foot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're off balance it's very difficult to do but if you've got both feet firmly planted because you're you're grounded in your beliefs and your actions flow from them then you've got competence and confidence mm -hmm. both yes 
And I think the um, if we take that metaphor a little bit further, and this I, I may have even got this from your book, um, that when you are grounded like that, you know, the wind can blow around you, there can be storms, and yes, you might get a bit wet or a bit cold, but you're you're firm, you can withstand them, you you're confident enough to withstand those challenges when they arise. And I, I was thinking as you were speaking about another example of a sort of a canon that I hear over and over again that people uh, espouse as their theory, uh, but it's not necessarily in their practice, is that the mediator line, I control the process and the clients control the content, as if they are distinct things that can be separated in real life, which, you know, we all know is not actually the case. But there's this line that people use over and over again as if it explains what they're doing, but it doesn't actually explain what they're doing. <laughs> and, they, and a lot of people don't even realise. Well, and it doesn't work. <laughs> frankly, yeah. uh, I don't think it does. Um, because if you really fundamentally, and this is, the, this is what I feed back to folks, I say, do you believe in self-determination? Mm -hmm. And that self-determination is fundamentally uh, at the core of our work as mediators, and it distinguishes our work from other forms of dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, absolutely. Are there any limits on self-determination. Well, what do you mean? Well, are there any decisions over which the parties should not, or you do not believe they should have, influence and the opportunity to hear information and make choices for themselves? Oh, like what? I said, for example, if you decide that you want to meet in caucus, mm -hmm. do the parties, do you explain to the parties why you feel that way? Mm -hmm. What your thinking is? Do you give them the option to say, no, we'd rather stay here in joint session? Mm -hmm. Or if you're meeting in joint session, do you give them, do you say to them, you always have the choice to meet with me separately mm -hmm. for your own reason? Do you do that? Because <clears throat> then they're involved in the process, aren't they? Not just in the content. Yeah. They're and involved even, in Go ahead, even please. Even a step further than that, when you have them in the joint session, do you d direct who speaks first? Do you say, will you start? Because even though that's a process choice, it's going to have an impact on the content because the first person who speaks the second person is likely, even if we say to them, please just don't just get defensive and respond, say it in your own words, is going to be defensive and respond to a certain extent, unless they have some sort of Buddhist like <laughs> control over their emotions. Um, so, you know, there's, there's all of those situations that arise that um, many people never reflect on. And it was one of the conundrums for me when I was teaching. And, and that's another thing I wanted to say to you. And I, I didn't, it's, it probably is in your book, but I don't remember seeing it explicitly as, you know, this is one of the things that you can do to reflect. But for me, the work that I do training mediators and coaches now more than mediators, for me, is an amazing form of reflective practice. Because in depending on how you teach, of course, if you're just sort of a didactic, I present what you should do and, and you don't have a conversation with the students, then maybe not so much. But the kind of interactive teaching that I have with my students and in the conflict leaderships groups, I learn so much out of supporting them to reflect on their practice. For me, that's a form of reflection as well. Of course, you know, <clears throat> I was just looking over and uh, taped to um, uh, an area on my desk is a word called, is a word isomorphic mm -hmm. that I learned from a friend, Bob Staines. And um, he, we were discussing this in the context of the development of a training program and that all of the methods that you use as a trainer need to be consistent with what you're training them to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you say that reflection is an integral part of your work as a coach, if you're, if you're training a coach, and your work with your, the coaches work with their clients, then how is that reflected in the way in which you teach them? Mm -hmm. And if it is, 
then there is a, there's a nice, a lovely unity that makes sense. Otherwise, there's a disconnection. Yeah. You know, how do you teach uh, a facilitated process using very directive methods? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work. Yeah. 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 And again, I think it's worth um, acknowledging that in some ways it feels quicker just to give an answer, just to give a quick bit of advice, a quick bit of direction. And I think there's always that tension between the quality of reflection that, that you can facilitate and the amount of time that you have to do it. And I think in some mediation contexts where you only have a limited amount of time to reach an agreement, in Australia, I think the, the standard for a family mediation, the standard time allowed in many of the court connected programs is around three hours, which is not a lot. Um, you know that you, you may not be motivated by the, the contextual risk constraints to do more than the bare minimum in getting people to that resolution as quickly as you can, even if it means putting them in separate rooms and doing some kind of shuttle process. Well, that's what it, it tends to lead to. I don't think it has to be that way. Yeah. I think that mediators can learn how to be very effective in a three hour process that doesn't require them to compromise their beliefs about what they would, that what they might do had they unlimited amount of time. Yeah. Because I get this from, from court mediators. Mm -hmm. They say, well, you know, you're in private practice. You can do whatever you want. I say, fine, give me a, I'll sit in with you. I'll show you how it's possible to do a significant piece of work in only three hours mm. without having to compromise my beliefs about what mediation consists of, how I engage as and what my role is, and how I invest the parties, invite the parties to, to take on their roles um, in the process. Mm. I said it's, mu it's actually much harder to mediate in caucus. It takes longer to mediate in caucus than it does to, well, no, but then they get into all these arguments and yeah. <laughs> right. Good. That's they kind do. of our work, right? <laughs> Managing arguments. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, wh wh why would they need us? Do they, <laughs> if they needed a switchboard operator, um, <laughs> they could find any number of people who could who could just be messengers. You know, like the uh, uh, I forgot which is the Shakespeare play with Pyramus and Thisbe passing messages through the wall. Yeah. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, we are more than that. We are more capable than that. And we limit ourselves if that's how we see our role. Mm. Uh, we can do vastly more yeah. uh, to feel good about our work, but even more importantly, to help the parties. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's about that um, willingness to engage in lifelong learning, to always aspire to artistry, to be constantly wanting to develop ourselves for our own sake, but also for the people that we're working with. And perhaps um, that's a motivation to do so. And if, if we're getting our rewards in a superficial way and that's getting us through our working life, there's, and there's maybe not a lot of incentive for people to do things differently until something goes wrong and then they suddenly realize that all those years of experience didn't prepare them for this one unexpected moment and then what <laughs> oh but then it was the clients were not ready <laughs> then we'll blame somebody else for the context of the time they were just resistant right yeah yeah or so or the answer is well some do some don't yeah. Right. And um, and I agree with that. Some do, some don't. That's not a rationale for failing to think about what it was that occurred that you can learn from. Yeah. So how do we sell reflective practice to very competent, very confident, very experienced practitioners who don't see the value in it? right now, how do we sell it to them as something that they can then be invested in engaging with? You know, I, <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's the, that's the proverbial million dollar question, right? <laughs> I thought I'd just put it out there. <laughs> no, no, of course, of course, we, because, because I think about it all the time. 
-huh. You know, I think about, you know, here, you know, the other day I did a, a brief presentation to uh, a group of mediators here in Florida. And uh, I was, I don't know, I just didn't get through to them. You know, three of the 15 uh, or 16 or 18, however many there were, responded to me and asked for more information. And that's good. And um, uh, the others, I, 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 in some ways, it was a problem of uh, video conferencing mm -hmm. because more than half of them had their cameras off. Okay. So I couldn't see them. Uh, they were, it was at lunchtime, they could have been just sitting there munching on their sandwich and, uh, and just I was background noise mm -hmm. as, they, as they ate their lunch and sent off a couple of emails. Um, but I tried to, when I talk to people, I really talk to them about the tangible benefit that they will see that their practice improves. Mm -hmm. They will feel more confident about their work. They will be competent at what they do. The parties they work with will experience something different and beneficial to them. It, it may or may not, I don't try to say that it's going to affect their settlement rates because I don't want to get into that mm. kind of thing. But I said it's an overall better experience for everybody if you feel as though you are at the top of your game. Mm. And then <clears throat> I try to use whatever metaphor seems most appropriate, playing golf, playing tennis, whatever it could be, you know, referring to um, sports figures. Or I use a quote, which I can't remember now, from Pablo Casals, the, the brilliant cellist, who at 93 was practicing every day. So, you know, because there's still something to learn. Yeah. I find those kinds of metaphors to say, look, you know, people who are, are, are brilliant don't just stop when they achieve some level of brilliance and achievement and, uh, and attainment and recognition. They keep striving to get better and better because they see the possibility of their work. They see the elegance in it, the artistry in it. Yeah, yeah. It's not an easy sell. I mean, you've really, <clears throat> you have to find the right metaphor, I think, for the right group of people. Yeah. And so when I'm, when I'm addressing a large group, I use multiples mm -hmm. because some people will be arts oriented, some people will be um, uh, sports oriented. So, you know, I've just, you just have to try to find those. And even that's, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised. That that and maybe works. also finding their personal hero, someone they really look up to and think, wow, you know, what they do is just a whole nother level. And then trying to demonstrate how that person has achieved that whole nother level by undergoing a process of continual reflective practice. Um, and, and pointing out that, that, you know, maybe you'll never be exactly at that person's level, but why not try to get close to it by doing the same kind of things that they've been doing? So maybe we need some, like you, some more reflective practice heroes out there who, are, who people can look up to and think, wow, it worked for them. Maybe I should give that a try. Yeah. And, and I do think when I'm, when I'm in, a, <clears throat> sorry, in a more intimate setting, not, you know, uh, two or 300 people or 50 people or 25 even. And especially if it's ongoing, it's, it's a lot easier to be able to say to somebody, what would you like your practice to be yeah. like? Yeah. What would you like to experience as a practitioner? And then when we're in our reflective practice groups and somebody is describing a situation, the question is, is back to them, what's your question? What is it that you're interested in learning about to make it personal to them so that it isn't me trying to figure out what they need? Mm. And it's the same thing that I encounter so often with mediators, which is they assume what the parties want, but they don't ask the simple question. Yeah. 
whether it's about process or about the content. Yeah. And, you know, Michael, in my experience with clients in in conflict as well as with trainee conflict coaches or mediators a lot of those people once they're trying it once they're in the process of being supported through a reflective process really understand the value of it you know what is once they've tried it you know, a large percentage of people are on board. They see the value of it immediately. There's always a small group of people who are very resistant to change. And I think that sort of gets in the way of reflective practice and, and managing conflict effectively. Uh, so those people are always going to be resistant because reflective practice involves some kind of change. Uh, not necessarily changing your practice, not necessarily changing your mind, but changing the way you think about both of those things, what goes on in your mind and your practice. But I think it's a, it's a, a little bit about giving people a try before you buy experience as well, because most people, when they experience it, immediately understand the value. One of the things that coaching clients will very often say to me is, when I came into this session, I didn't really think that there was much new that I was going to be able to do anything different. But it turned out it was all in my head. I just didn't know it was there. You know, I just didn't, I couldn't see it because I was so fixated on what I thought was happening and what I thought was the answer. I'd lost this stuff that was already there and you kind of helped me get that out. And people have that experience. It's like an epiphany for them. Wow. And they realize that a lot of the time there's so much more going on that they can access themselves, maybe with a little bit of support from a coach or, or you know, someone who's running a reflective practice type group. I, I think one really good experience can get people on board, you know, for the rest of their, their life in a way. Mm -hmm. How do you do that with your clients? I'd be interested to know with your coaching clients. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So with the coaching model, one of the things that we kind of base the whole philosophy on, well, there's four things. The REAL stands for reflection, engagement, artistry, and learning. And for me, I guess what I thought was when I'm working with clients in conflict, particularly one-on-one, -on -one, very often they... Uh, they need to reflect on their experience in a different way. They do it in a very superficial way. They only pay attention to certain things. They make a lot of assumptions. We all know that in conflict, people jump to conclusions very quickly and they're often <laughs> misleading or incomplete. So part of what I do in a coaching process is to help them unpack all the stuff that's in their head and look at it differently and question their assumptions and the information that they have, the dots they've connected. So, I mean, the basic process, we start out with a goal, although in a process of reflective practice, I'm not 100% convinced that starting with a goal is necessarily the right, the right way to start because one of the downside I'm, I'm finding through a process of reflective practice is that some people then hang on to that goal for dear life and um, it can narrow their thinking in terms of other possibilities. Um, so that's something actually that I've been rethinking and talking with my students about. It really upsets them when I've taught them something and then I, I come to the next group and I say, you know what? I'm thinking maybe we shouldn't do that. And they're like, oh, come on. I only just felt confident doing it. Um, so, but we do start with a goal. I think it's probably more like an idea of what their goal is at the start as a tentative kind of idea of where they think they're heading. The next stage is, is about exploring what happened. And I use the analogy that I take them right back to the start of the conflict, um, you know, insofar as that's practical. And then maybe a little bit before that, because often the where they choose to start the story um, leaves out some important information that comes before. Um, and I take them back through that really slowly. And as they leap from sort of, say stepping stone to stepping stone I say what's in between these stepping stones and what's under that one and what's that over there that we just rushed past so it's a very much a process of slowing down um, their memory of their experience At, in that initial stage it's very much oriented to just kind of getting the facts although they're obviously not necessarily facts they're there it's their version of what's happened and their experience up to now and really unpacking it from sort of a, a plot outline into something that's much more nuanced. I feel like I've understood what they were thinking, what they were feeling, you know, as much as possible, given whatever amount of time we have. 
the next stage in the process after we've sort of complexified that story a little bit without necessarily challenging them just being very curious and asking a lot of questions to fill in gaps and ask for a little bit more information about their thoughts and feelings the next stage is very much about their feelings so it's the why does this matter and this is very much at that onion type thing where why it matters on the surface when you actually ask some more questions goes down to you know different values different expectations um, emotions, power, all sorts of different things come up there. One of the things that I think is really interesting is a lot of people think that's the easy part. And when we actually talk about it in more depth, they realize it's much more complicated than they thought. They realize that actually there are a whole lot of different values that we're impacting on the choice that they made in that moment. And they haven't really given um, consideration to the relevance of those values and what that does is then gives them a, an, some, a broader value base I suppose to make choices about what to do next. So often that stage is a bit of a, an eye opener for people, maybe a heart opener, where they start to realise that the, the meaning of this for them is something different to what they'd sort of thought about superficially. That's more than feelings. Yes. But your your the feelings become um, uh, from what I'm hearing, uh, Sam, is that the feelings are a way of helping them think about and get in touch with their real needs and their Absolutely. real goals. Yes, yeah. their needs, their value, their sense of identity. The feelings, more often than not, are a, a symptom of something else. Um, and so we, we talk about their feelings, but we also talk about where they're coming from, not in the sense of therapy, you know, going back through, you know, their, their family dynamics and how that might have react, it would cause them to react in this way in a, in a more pragmatic sense, I suppose, in a conflict coaching context. So we're not aiming to um, analyze where all that came from. We're more looking at what's the impact it's having on them right now um, and what might need to shift there. Um, the next stage is an other perspective stage where we ask them to try and reflect back on the same things we've just talked about, but from different people's perspectives. And one of the, the tricks that I, it sounds sort of disingenuous when I say a trick, but a technique that I teach the students to use is to not say, say something like, what do you think Joe would think about that? Is to say to them, if Joe were here today, and I said, how are things going between you and Bill? What do you think Joe would say? And if I said to Joe, what, what do you think, what matters the most for you, Joe, in this situation that you have with Bill? What do you think he would say? And we often find um, a very different response. People think about it very differently if you, if you frame the question as them answering in that person's words. So we do an other perspective stage. At that point, we then it's almost like asking them for a goal again, but it's a little bit more broad. We say, well, you know, given that discussion we've had, what do you think your preferred future would look like? You know, we might not use that exact language. We've adapted to the client, but, you know, ideally, let's try and be optimistic, but realistic. What would you like the future to look like in this situation? And then we get them to describe it in a lot of detail, not... I'd be happier at work or he wouldn't annoy me so much or we wouldn't fight every time we did handover with the kids. We ask them to describe in detail what that would look like, what it would feel like. Um, and then we go to standard action planning. Right, what are some things that you think you might be able to do to work towards that? What's the first thing you might do? And okay, you've suggested this. What are some ways you might improve on that? I mean, it sounds like you think that's a good idea, but what might you do to make it even better? You know, what could you add to that or how could you tweak that? And, and you know, within reason, motivate and encourage people to keep trying a little bit harder, I suppose, keep reflecting a little bit deeper um, to add value. And then one of the things that we do um, right at the end, and I say to my students, we do this in every single coaching session, even if we don't get very far through the process, even if we've spent an hour on what happened and, you know, that we've got no chance of getting to an action plan today, um, if that's appropriate for the client in this context, we always do a 10 to 15 minute session of, of actual specific reflection, where we say to the client, reflecting back on our conversation today, 
what's new for you? What stood out for you? You know, in your words, what was what was surprising for you? And that those moments are very rewarding as a coach, but also pivotal, pivotal, pivotal for the clients because often until you ask them to articulate it, it hasn't really sunk in. And some of the things that clients come out with at that moment, you just think, wow. That, and, and they have that moment, like, wow, it just suddenly dawned on me. Like, wow, they often get that response. And I think if we miss that step out, they may still get there, but actually holding them in a space and asking them to do it in the moment, I find brings things together. Um, not necessarily ties up every loose end, but it will highlight the most important shifts for them or the most important realizations. Um, and it's, gives them some kind of, I don't know, it feels good. Sometimes it feels a bit scary because often it, 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 it unpacks all those assumptions that had been keeping them comfortable, um, but it prepares them for a more realistic interaction in the future. And, and what's realistic isn't always ideal. You know, if people often come in with this idealized idea idea of what the outcome is and what justice looks like and when we actually really unpack it they sometimes realize mm, that's actually not going to really work or be possible and yep that sucks but let's acknowledge it and then say now what now what you might not be able to change that but you have a choice about what to do in response to it so that's yeah, pretty see, much I, I, I listen to that and coming back to what i was saying about isomorphic that's mm -hmm. a perfect example of that that if what you're doing in your interactions up to that moment where up to that last bit is based on some principles of reflective practice, that, that you're asking the parties, the, the coaching client, your, your philosophy is that if I engage with the client as I am leading them through all of these steps, the R-E-A-L, right? If I'm using some notions about reflective practice to do that, then why not fully implement that at the end as you do by inviting them to do that kind of reflection on what was it that they have learned about themselves from the last 45 minutes or however long it has been? Up to that point and it's uh, that's magnificent and giving them a chance to do it on their own without so much prompting and structure from me give, giving them a chance to do it you know sort of free range i suppose now without me asking you specific questions tell me what's been happening for you what and yeah it's a it's a really magical thing not, i should clarify though that the rea the, the R-E-A-L aren't the steps. They're the philo philosophical underpinning. So the steps are very much what happened, why does it matter? I should um, talk briefly about the others. So reflection is, you know, what reflection is clearly. Um, engagement, what, what we mean when we talk about engagement is that people engage with the conflict insofar as it's safe for them, but engage rather than just avoid it or just skim over the surface, that they actually engage with it, explore it, think about it, um, try to do what they can to, to influence it in a positive way. That sometimes means not actively engaging in, for example, a conversation if it's unsafe, but in, engaging as opposed to avoiding, I suppose, is the kind of key part of that. The A is for artistry, something that you're very familiar with as well. And they, these things are all interrelated. We want our coaches to aspire to artistry by ongoing reflective development in their practice, but we want our clients to aspire to artistry. Let's not just do the bare minimum to make this conflict go away. Let's see what you can do that might be even better, that might be longer lasting, that might set you up to avoid this kind of thing in the future, or might build a relationship with this, this person, not just end it civilly. You know, dip, so we want to encourage them to do better than what they what is good enough, but but not maybe very artistic, I suppose. And the L is about learning. It's about learning from your own experience and and a commitment to ongoing learning. And that's one of the things we also reinforce with the clients. Yes, in this session we've had today, you may have learned a few things about yourself, the situation, other people, what's important to you. 
but it's not going to stop here. You know, you're going to go away after this session and you're going to think about some of these things. You're going to notice things differently. You're going to respond to things hopefully differently and better than some of the, <laughs> the less proud moments you've had in the past. Um, don't, don't lose the momentum. Keep thinking about those things and asking the kinds of questions we've done here in between sessions or afterwards if, if we're not having another one. So they're the sort of, they're the, there's a sort of our philosophy of what we're trying to do and why. The steps are much more pragmatic. But I guess it, the, the real elements is the purpose that drives our practice in the very pragmatic stages. That if you're going to ask a question, is it for one of those reasons? Or are Thank you just... You. Curious I, got, or interrogating. <laughs> I got myself confused. Thank you. That, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and we say and, that the things that we hope to do with the client, again, very pragmatically, we say we want them to develop the five C's. The first one is clarity, being clearer about their experiences and what's gone on. The second one is comprehension, and that's about having a depth of understanding. So not just getting the facts straight, but having a, a depth of understanding about how those facts came to be. The third one is choices. And we want clients to recognize that they will have made choices, even if they feel like they're the you know, helpless victim of somebody else's actions, they will have made choices or not made choices, which is a choice in itself in the past. We want them to recognize those and to reflect on them. Were they good choices or were there different choices they could have made? And we want them to realize that they have choices in the future. They might be limited, they might not be ideal, all of them might <laughs> feel like bad choices, but they do have an opportunity to take some control over their own future by making a choice. Um, the last two is the competence and confidence. So they're the things that we want clients to walk away with through our process of kind of reflective practice. So yeah, I mean, I think it's the same thing that I do with my coach students and my reflective practice groups. But instead of us talking about a professional intervention, we're talking about this person's life experience in this particular conflict context. In a way, it's the same process. It's just a different setting that we're, we're enabling it or supporting it. What I'm, what I'm uh, delighting in is hearing about your descriptions because what they speak to is doing with, not doing to the client. And, and you know, when we were talking earlier about, uh, about some of the ways in which mediation is practiced, it is that sense that I know so much. Mm -hmm. I and, and, and it includes whether I'm a content expert, right, in this particular field. Um, I actually had, had a, you know, this after 35 years of practice, a, um, uh, an, an attorney said, no, I don't want you as a mediator because you're not a Florida attorney. Okay. okay. All right. That's that's your choice. Um, <clears throat> but it is that sense that that come to me, and I will take care of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the success rate. Look at my success rate. I can give you what I think you need, not necessarily what you need. <laughs> and and for me, it's always come with me. Yeah. Let's work this together. Yeah. I've had some interesting incidents recently in reflective practice groups. Where, um, where the answer to the dilemma that the, that the party, that the client, that, sorry, that the mediator was experiencing in the moment. I'll give you one quick example. Um, trying to work out a custody arrangement and, and uh, one of the parties was just, um, couldn't make decisions. It, and, and the other one was being very forthcoming and saying, look, whatever you want, is this good for you? If that's not, then how about this? If neither of those are good, what would you like? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Couldn't make a choice. And, uh, and the mediator said, the reason I'm bringing this to conversations because I don't, I'm, I'm ready to end the mediation. And I said, and I said, so ultimately, I won't recount the entire conversation that took 45 minutes. Um, the ultimate conclusion she came to is, why didn't I just, why don't I just ask her what she needs mm -hmm. from me, from the process, uh -huh. in order to be able to make a decision? She had all the information she needed. That wasn't the issue. Yeah. What do you need? 
you tell me. Yeah. And that's an, an example of working with somebody and not saying, look, um, <clears throat> the father has presented you with all these proposals. They're good proposals. Choose one. Mm -hmm. They match your general needs. Choose one. Yeah. 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 And I think in a, if that was happening to me in a coaching session, the, the response that I'd be likely to give would be something like, I noticed that you don't seem willing to, to make a choice. Tell me what's yes. going on. Tell of me what's course. going on for you. What's, tell me about that. And right. just see what happens. I mean, maybe there's a very good reason. <laughs> now, maybe they don't necessarily need something from me. Maybe I just need to hear what's, what's their thinking behind the way that they're behaving. Totally. And, you know, I've said to many mediators in training, <clears throat> pardon me, we have an enormous power that we seldom, if ever, use. The power to notice, mm -hmm. non-judgmentally. Yeah. Exactly. And what you just said, Sam, is a perfect and, and gracious and graceful example of that. How you invite the person to talk about themselves so that the more they talk about themselves, the more you learn how you can be responsive to them. Yeah. Oh. One of the things we talk about a lot in our coach training is that when you're working one-on-one -on -one with a client, you don't need to summarize very much. And maybe if it's helpful to, to help the client who's very confused, put things in order. But, but basically when we're summarizing for the client, we're filling up airtime and it's us thinking and them listening to us, not listening to themselves. So what I say to the coach trainees is try to summarize as, as as less as you can, as little as you can. I don't think that's grammatically correct, but not as not as much as you would do in a mediation. Um, if you're about to do it, ask yourself quickly, why? Why do I think it's appropriate? If there are some good reasons, like the client's really confused and it might be helpful, maybe that's okay. But if it's just because it's kind of your habit or you want them to feel like you're paying attention, there may be other things you can do that don't fill up so much airspace. And perhaps then focus the client on what you've summarized rather than where they were going next in their train of thought. So we talk about the two main techniques or skills that, that we want our coaches to use. One is questioning, obviously open-ended are better than closed because it allows the client to continue on, um, but also the observation observing in a neutral, non-judgmental, supportive way what you're noticing in what the client's saying or their body language or their emotional reaction and just observing it without necessarily a question attached and just saying, I'm noticing this, pause and see where it goes. Right. And you know, that's, they're amazing interventions that, that don't require us to have a very detailed hypothesis to make sure that we're asking the right question you know, we just put it out there gently and see what, what happens. And that's so powerful. And it can be because we don't have enough information to form a useful hypothesis. Yeah, absolutely. And in coaching, I think that's maybe more likely to be the case because generally speaking, we're only coaching one side of the conflict, not like mediation where we've got a little bit of both sides of a story. So we have to be very careful that we don't buy the story as the whole story, the truth. We, you know, we have to keep reminding ourselves that we're getting an interpretation of a situation from this person's experience and that who are we to judge which bits are accurate or missing or you know, invalid. No, that's exactly right. That's their choice. Yeah. yeah. We can help um, identify places that they might want to explore. That would help them question some of their assumptions mm -hmm. but that's not up to us to judge them yeah. and to and to substitute ours yeah and people are much more resistant if they feel like you're leading them somewhere if you're trying to get them to see something <laughs> whereas if you're just following along and you know kind of being curious about things they're much more likely to respond and then often they develop insight sort of accidentally in in being interested in the fact that you're interested in what's going on for them. The greatest gift that, that we can have is the use of our curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, think about your five-year-old. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Questions, and the questions that she asks. Questions, right? I know. And, and as soon as you've answered, the question is why? Uh-huh. answer that question. Yeah. 
And then but what goes, if? But what if she's very good at the hypothetical? But what if? Oh, you know, even it's, better. It's a really good example. Five year olds are really good at reflective practice because they don't have a lot of knowledge. They don't have a lot of experience. They learn by constantly experimenting, they, by rethinking things as they gather a bit of information, as people ask them questions, you know, they, they're constantly relearning, you know, everyday life skills. They're such they're a great voracious. example. Right. They're yeah. hungry, they're voracious, yeah. and they are not easily satisfied. Yeah. with and yeah. it was there because they want more and more and more yeah and i guess people who are naturally like that who are naturally curious and questioning are more likely to adapt and and be invested in reflective practice people who aren't curious who prefer you know to follow the canon and to just do what they're told you know, maybe it's easier but but you know it does it does involve a lot of curiosity um, which, you know, some people like you and I, we thrive on that. That's what brings us joy, you know, wondering about what we don't know and what we could do differently. Um, and maybe that's the key. Maybe that's the million dollar question. How do we motivate people who don't have that naturally to engage in some of those activities? I don't know. <laughs> There's so much more to this, isn't there? There is. Michael, I've got a very pragmatic question um, that I think would help some of my um, coaching students. What do you think are the essential things to do to reflect on your practice? One of the particular questions one of the students asked me to ask you was, is there sort of a balance between written reflection and oral reflection or verbal reflection? You know, so um, this particular student does a lot of journaling and, and um, has read your book and kind of asks the sort of questions that you would expect to ask. But what's the, the benefit or the weight of doing that sort of self-reflection in writing and the conversational type reflection that you get in a reflective practice group? Yeah, I think one of the challenges I mean, some of us are very, very good at the internalization, mm -hmm. um, whether we write it down or we just think about it mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and genuinely reflect, not just think, not just recount, but reflect. Yeah. Um, others of us need the interaction with people. Um, the, 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 the possible limitation of only doing it in writing, even for those like me. I'm a, I'm a very, very, on the Myers-Briggs scale, I am surprisingly way at the end of the introversion. Uh -huh. And um, because I love to take things in and think about them, I describe myself sometimes as like an old um, stone mill you know, that, that just grew, had these two big stones that grind the grain down to powder, right? Uh -huh. That's me, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> which can be a problem, but it's also a gift, you know. Um, yeah. I take it mostly as a gift. Um, the value of the oral part is that somebody else is engaging with you and they will have a slightly different perspective on what's happening for you. Not that they will tell you the answer, mm -hmm. but they will have different questions to ask than you've asked yourself. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think that it's really, really important to do the oral part, no matter how much writing you want to do. Yeah, yeah. And for me, that's the more um, fun part in a way, you know, the, the unexpected questions or the unexpected reactions and in a group, seeing people's reactions to other people's experiences and answers to their questions and the excitement when someone asks a question and the person's like, whoa, okay, I have to think about that. You know, when, when someone has that reaction, it's always like, great question. <laughs> Look at them thinking about that. Uh, yeah, well, for me, that's the, the valuable bit, the bit that I really enjoy. You know, I can, I can do my self-reflection and I see the value in it, but for me, that engaged interaction really... I don't know, gets me really inspired and enthusiastic. And I'm the I, sort of person who figures out what I think by talking out loud. So it helps in that way as well. Yeah, I, I think there's a, for each of us, there will be a balance. We need both. We need some quiet time, yeah. alone time, and we need the group time. 
And some people, um, you know, it's like a, a U-shaped tube. For some, they need much more of one than the other, but they need both. Mm -hmm. I think I need both. And I my experience tells me yeah. that other people do as well. And how would you recommend that practitioners who aren't necessarily very academic, who haven't got a background in, in you know, like a master's of conflict resolution or something like that, how would you suggest they best engage with theory? Well, I think to start, it would be helpful for them to think about what their beliefs are mm -hmm. and to realize that they are already steeped in theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't, it came, some of it may have come from books. Some of it came, may have come from mom and dad. Some of it may have come from, you know, teachers, mentors, religious leaders, you know, a variety, life experience, mm -hmm. um, the culture they grew up in. Yeah, um, yeah all of that. Yeah. And, and that's why the idea about the constellation of theories was, uh, was so brilliant. That, yeah. You know, when Allison and I were talking about this, this mass of, of ideas that people carry around in their head, she had the idea of sort of doing a graphic of the constellation. She says it's one way to depict what's going on. Mm -hmm. And at the center are those core values, those core principles that are not going, they are essentially immutable. They're so fundamental to how we see ourselves. Yeah. And then there are the others. And I think, so that's, I think, the first step. Uh -huh. The second um, is to find pieces to read that are accessible. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I talk about this in the book, that, that a lot of us, uh, myself included, when we start reading a research article, you know, our, our eyes go like this, you know, and, and oh my gosh, and the chi square this, and the, you know, this, oh, I, I don't understand the methodologies, so it's really difficult to make sense of that. Yeah. And so what I say to people, even if you're reading something like that, read what their question was, what were they going to explore, and then read the conclusion. You may not understand how they got from the idea to the, uh, well, if not the conclusion, the results. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can at least, understand. so it's another way of beginning to incorporate some information into you that, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean doing an academic degree in your discipline. I think oh, technology I has helped in a way make those sorts of things more accessible and a lot of academics are blogging or a lot of people who blog in the field will reference um, those sort of resources and summarize them. It's something I personally try to do quite a lot is to try and make some of that stuff accessible to my students and, and people out there generally. Um, because I know that I, I had the luxury of the time and I quite enjoy reading some of those things, although I must admit often I don't understand the technical sides of the methodologies either. But I think what I can, can contribute to my students um, and the people in my community of practice is I can synthesize and summarize and make those sorts of things accessible. And if it comes with some reflective questions about how that might apply or, uh, you know, maybe prompt them to consider what they do in a different way, then that's really useful as well. But with the constellation of theories, the, so I run a couple of different groups there. It's all under the banner of what we call the conflict leadership program. A lot of them are practitioners, but many of them are people who are managers or who are senior medical doctors um, who have to manage conflict in the course of their kind of other role rather than it being their job or their consultancy business. We did an exercise a couple of months ago, which was so much fun and so interesting. And I think in a way it was a kind of constellation of theory. What we uh, decided we would all do in between our sessions was we would write our own practice manifesto. And in this manifesto, we had to talk about who we were in our role as a conflict resolution practitioner and why we were. And so we had to not just be talking about, you know, oh, I use this process and this is the model that I use and this is my years of practice and experience. It had to be much more personal about, and I said, imagine that 
all of us put our manifestos up on a wall and a client came in and we all did exactly the same thing in more or less exactly the same way, how would they be able to distinguish you from everybody else in the group? And the sort of things that people put in there were just mind blowing. And I think really prompted them to think about what they did and articulate what they did, as you said, putting their theory in, in use into words, being able to actually describe it. It was such a powerful experience. It was, and the thing, when people read them out, you could just see the passion and the, the learning. It was such a fun activity. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And one of the and students came up with it, so it wasn't my idea, but it, gosh, it was a winner. <laughs> it's, it's a winner, and that's exactly a way to be able to get to the answer to the question of uh, one answer to the question about do I have to be an academic? Do I do I have to be able to read these you know journal articles that are written for other scholars but not for me as a practitioner? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm conscious of the time. I could probably talk to you for hours more, but it's been nearly 90 minutes already. <laughs> and I don't want to keep you here for, for much longer. People may be getting tired. I'm just going to have a quick look. Um, I think I've covered... Most yeah, I do have to leave in a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. Oh, look, it's been so valuable and um, so stimulating. And I'm sure that um, not just me, anyone who watches this is going to have a lot of food for thought and hopefully will inspire and motivate some people to give reflective practice a try to, even if they don't join an official group, create their own with some colleagues um, and ask each other those kind of questions and challenge each other to aspire to artistry. It's, you know, it's such an amazing experience. Exactly. And then maybe we'll do a follow up conversation because the one what we didn't do is talk about how you do reflective practice. Uh -huh. We talked about the value of it, the, the uh, how it inspires um, and excites us, how it, you know, we didn't talk even about the specific benefits no, that uh, that accrue. Well, that's because this is a huge topic. It isn't something that's, um, you know, that can easily be captured in 90 minutes. Yeah. If, um, it, if, if, it, if it could be, um, then, uh, then uh, I don't know, I can't imagine, then it would be a pretty thin yeah. and uninteresting yeah. thing. And I don't think I would be very interested in- It would be easy, uh, but not very valuable. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so this is the first of who knows how many. I would love to speak to you anytime. It's been such a great experience. And as I said, your, your book with Alison really changed the trajectory of my practice and the way that I develop my practice and now the way that I work with students and clients in my practice. So I, I honestly, it is the one book, if, I, if people ask me, which is the book that's had most of an impact on your career, that is the one. And it's, it's often not what people expect. They're like, oh, it's not like some dense theory on conflict, you know, techniques or, you know, <laughs> theories underlying why conflict arises and escalates. I'm like, no, it's about reflective practice and developing artistry. <laughs> the rest of the stuff's easy. <laughs> and, and, in, and in fact, the techniques that we teach aren't that difficult to learn yeah. as techniques. The application of them and why you would choose them now that's that's um, uh, that's a lifetime's work. Yes. Um, just one other thing I was going to mention earlier. I'm just reading a book. I'm almost finished it. It's called Think Again by Adam Grant. I don't know if you've read it. He's a psychologist. It's only just come out in the last month or so. But he his whole book is about this idea of rethinking and the benefit of rethinking. And as I'm reading it, I'm just translating rethinking to reflection all the way through everything he talks about is about reflection and reflective practice um he, he, he it's one of those books you know on the new york times bestseller very easy to read very entertaining lots of anecdotes but in a way it is a book about being a reflective practitioner in whatever you do um, and it's a really fun read and i think i got the idea i think from that book about the being um 
uh, and having the imposter syndrome is actually a, a benefit because it makes you more likely to reflect and learn. And a couple of the other ideas that we've talked about, I think are sort of in there in a slightly different way, but that's a very accessible book about the benefits of rethinking. I, I want to read that. I read a review of it. Yeah. Um, and so I was aware of it, but um, right now I'm, I'm engaged in, a, in the project of doing another one of the books of collected pieces. Um, this one, we did one a year ago about family conflict during the pandemic. Now we're doing a follow-up with the stories of struggle and hope. Yeah. And um, uh, once I get this, this is the kind of thing, you know, I thought oh, this will be a great idea. Um, you know, we'll follow up with the second book. Yeah. And yeah. it has taken over my life uh -huh. for the last five weeks and probably for the next two. Till but we it's going to be an amazing product at the end of it. Well, it's remarkable. We have, we have people from 16 countries who've contributed. And there are pieces, in, in addition to English, in nine languages. And uh, altogether, we'll have probably about 85 or 90 contributors to the book. So yeah, it's a huge project. And uh, it's and fun. And in a way, those sorts of projects are really important in reflective practice because we're hearing the stories of other people working in the field, which we don't necessarily get in our day-to-day -day lives, other than, as you call it, I think, sharing war stories, which is kind of entertaining, but doesn't necessarily help us grow. This, mm -hmm. in a way, you're kind of turning it into a resource that's accessible for people to reflect on other people's experiences by reading the book and ask themselves some questions about what that might mean for them and their clients. Well, marvelous talking with you, Sam. You um, too, Michael. Thank you so much. I genuinely, I, I hope you understand. I know in my heart, I genuinely mean what an honor it is um, to finally get a chance to speak with you and my commitment, um, because I so value talking with you, that it's the first of many. I, I really hope so too. The feeling's definitely mutual. I feel like we, I found a kindred spirit in this <laughs> reflective practice world. <laughs> Amen to that. Thank you, Michael. Have a wonderful Thanks. day and we will definitely talk again soon. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Bye.